Tonight on Currents News, churches are going to open again, but will people return to the pews? I think people are hungry to get back to, you know, to normality. A virtual warning from America's top infectious disease doctor. A vaccine could be coming, but cities should remain cautious. And the virus still spreading behind bars. It hasn't flattened in prison. Instead, deaths are spiking. An expert is here to look deeper into the crisis. It's very hard to social distance them because of the environment. Plus, nationwide rationing is underway of the only drug to show promise in treating patients. And a miraculous recovery, how the Catholic faith is helping a brave nurse endure the pandemic storm. His fever was very high, so I was just praying if I could just break it. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. Church doors are still closed in the Diocese of Brooklyn, but the faith there seems to be growing every day. Tens of thousands are watching live stream TV masses, setting the stage for the day church doors finally open wide again. Cards News' Emily Druby asks the big question. With this new alternative, will people come back to the pews? Live streamed masses, a great solace for many as churches were shuttered to stop the spread of the deadly coronavirus. We're getting thousands of, of, of hits and it, they're coming from, from all over, uh, you know, the parish, but also from uh, around the country and around the world. We spoke with Auxiliary Bishop James Massa, who says the tool has been a great way for people to connect with their parish and their faith during the pandemic. But it is important for us to be together in worship. And if technology can, can help us to do that, then it is truly a gift from God. But now the world is slowly starting to reopen, and that includes churches. In Italy, the liturgy will resume on May 18th, while the Brooklyn Diocese has already launched a task force to prepare for their eventual opening. But the question remains, when churches do reopen, will people come back to the pews or will they stream services from home? Monsignor Michael Curran, a theology professor at St. Joseph's Seminary, says of course they will. It's been a tremendous blessing to have that available. We want to avoid that uh, idea where people would say, well, I can watch mass with a cup of coffee in my living room rather than actually go and be present. But I don't see that happening. I think people are hungry to get back to, you know, to normality. And they are. Parishioners all over the diocese are desperate to get back into their churches. And while watching from home technically doesn't fulfill the Catholic obligation, it's been successfully used in the Brooklyn Diocese and has been a great way for churches to connect with their parishioners. Only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Holy Name of Jesus Parish is live streaming, but they've taken it a step further, placing the Blessed Sacrament inside a window, a place for parishioners to feel closer to the church while remaining socially distant. We've gotten positive feedback and we'll plan to keep it there for the duration of the, uh, of the um, until the church is open. The church's pastor, Father Lawrence Ryan, says it's similar to what you would see at church in normal times. In Manhattan, Emily Druby, Currents News. Back to you, Christine. Yeah, Emily, I can tell you from my own experience, it's much easier getting my kids up and ready for church when it's in my living room. But I know you've talked to many parish priests and parishioners. How do you think people will react when those church doors are open again and the live stream liturgies just aren't necessary? Well, Christine, parishioners are so excited to get back into their churches. But I will say that live stream masses are going to be a great plan B option going forward for those who can't go to church. Um, for example, if you're sick, maybe you've moved and you want to check in on your old parish. And in that sense, we've created this great new evangelization tool. Christine? Yeah, it's great to have that option, Emily. Thank you. Net TV, New York's Catholic station, is now broadcasting live TV masses in eight languages. The liturgies are on the air Sunday and throughout the week. The full schedule is listed at netny.tv. High drama today when top White House health experts warned the country is not out of the woods yet and opening the country too soon will lead to more deaths. That's in contrast to what President Trump is saying. Karen Kaifa has the story from Washington. A warning from the nation's top health experts on the coronavirus pandemic ravaging the country. It's important to emphasize that we're not out of the woods yet. 
More than 80,000 people in the United States have died after testing positive for the virus. Dr. Anthony Fauci, a key member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, cautioned the death toll is likely higher and predicted dire consequences if states open too soon. My concern is that we will start to see little spikes that might turn into outbreaks. The Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor and Pensions hearing showcased just how much COVID-19 has disrupted everyday life. Senator Lamar Alexander chaired the committee while in self-quarantine. Witnesses testified remotely and some on Capitol Hill wore masks. But the social distancing didn't stop the tension. And as much as I respect you, Dr. Fauci, I don't think you're the end all. I don't think you're the one person that gets to make a decision. I'm a scientist, a physician and a public health official. I give advice according to the best scientific evidence. Finding an effective vaccine is crucial to beating COVID-19. While there are promising developments, experts say a vaccine is not expected by the time students return to school this fall. The idea of having treatments available or a vaccine would be something that would be a bit of a bridge too far. And while the coronavirus outbreak appears to be easing in some places, the fight is far from over. I think we're going in the right direction. But the right direction does not mean we have by any means total control of this outbreak. In Washington, Karen Kafa, Currents News. While Dr. Fauci is warning of the dangers of a second outbreak, prison systems are still struggling to control the first wave. Jails and prisons have not flattened the curve. Instead, new research shows deaths are spiking. According to the Marshall Project, there have been at least 20,000 cases confirmed among prisoners around the country. In just one week, 6,669 new coronavirus cases were confirmed, and that was more than four times the amount from the week before. For more on this subject, we'll be joined by criminal justice professor and expert John Patakis. He's taking a look at these numbers that aren't slowing. That's still ahead in this newscast. There's nationwide rationing tonight of the only drug that's shown promise in treating severe coronavirus patients. The shortage is forcing doctors to make tough decisions. Elizabeth Cohen has the story. Remdesivir, the only drug that's been shown in a large, rigorous study to fight COVID-19. Given limited supplies, the federal government has been doling it out, some hospitals getting less than they need, others getting none. New York State is working with HHS, uh, Health and Human Services on the federal side, administering it to 2,900 people at uh, 15 hospitals. The federal government has given New York enough remdesivir for 2,900 patients. But there are about 7,262 coronavirus patients in New York hospitals. That same situation playing out around the country. This vial from the first shipment of remdesivir received last week by Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, where Dr. Rochelle Walensky is chief of infectious diseases. We know that the doses of this drug that we are going to get are not going to be enough to treat every patient that we have in the hospital now. So they've had to make decisions about who gets remdesivir and who doesn't. This was hard. The federal government has never explained how they decided which hospitals would receive remdesivir and how much. This drug is promising and we want to get it to the American people and to the areas that need it most. Saturday, the federal government said in addition to sending remdesivir to hospital, they'd also sent to some state health departments and intend eventually to send it to all state health departments. But they haven't said how much they'll send to each state or their formula for determining those amounts. And now doctors trying to do their best to allocate this scarce resource. That was Elizabeth Cohen reporting. Doctors are still trying to figure out which patients remdesivir works best on. The federal government has studied the drug, but its findings still haven't been published. Here are some more headlines. The U.S. is recording its largest budget deficit in history, nearly three quarters of a trillion dollars. The shortfall comes from deferred tax payments and stimulus programs. Democrats in Congress are pushing for big aid packages for the states. Republicans are divided. And the lights on Broadway won't shine again until at least Labor Day. Theaters have been closed since March 12th. Today, the Supreme Court heard the case about keeping President Trump's taxes secret. The justices listened to three hours of oral arguments over whether the chief executive's financial records should be disclosed. Democrats in Congress and prosecutors in New York want to see them. A ruling is expected in July. 
Meantime, the president is locked up in a fight with Joe Biden for money. Both campaigns raked in over $60 million each in just April. But the Trump team has a big edge on money in the bank with hundreds of millions of dollars on hand. The National Democrats are taking their first steps toward a virtual presidential nominating convention. The DNC is looking at that as a last resort if delegates aren't allowed to gather in person this summer. Yesterday, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi suggested using a giant stadium for the convention with limited attendance. There's a lot more news headed your way. A miraculous COVID recovery told from the perspective of an ICU nurse. I'm Jessica East Hope with the message of hope she's passing on. Plus, while we're in lockdown to avoid the virus, those locked up can't escape it. An expert weighs in on the death toll in prison. And they hit the clubs and may have contracted the virus. When we come back, we'll tell you where a new cluster of cases popped up after businesses reopened. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. Now the story of strong Catholic faith fueling a brave nurse as she takes on the coronavirus pandemic. A miraculous recovery by a patient she feared was lost also helped her get through the storm. As National Nurses Week comes to a close, Currents News' Jessica Easthope has this uplifting report from Staten Island. For nurses around the world, their scrubs have become their suits of armor helping them bravely fight a war against an invisible enemy. Jessica Mock wears her armor proudly as an ICU nurse at a Brooklyn hospital in the epicenter of the COVID-19 crisis. We became a COVID positive ICU unit. So we became critical care nurses and now all my patients were sedated, intubated. Jess is unfortunately no stranger to loss. Back in high school, I actually lost my niece. Diana. She was the most bubbly little girl. She was perfect. She had something underdeveloped in her brain and that caused her to have a seizure and we lost her very early. It didn't take long for Jess to turn a tragedy into a positive and embrace her desire to help others. She is why I do what I do. But over the last few months, she's remembered how much of a toll loss can take. I felt like I was seeing more loss than wins and it was very defeating. Then something changed. He was on a ventilator, a perfectly healthy man. His fever was very high, so I was just praying if I could just break it. Jess could see the fight in that patient. I prayed, give strength to my patients to keep on fighting for their lives. And his will to live became her strength. Within weeks, he actually started controlling his breathing. He wasn't breathing over the vent. Then a couple more days after that, he was responsive. Now that's a huge win. That was my biggest win. Among the pain and sorrow of a hospital ICU unit came a glimmer of hope. My anxiety and fear of this whole pandemic, he changed it to hope. It's that story of survival that keeps Jess suiting up every day. Her message now to other nurses is the same as it is for her patients. We are fighting this together. So whether we're in a different hospital, a different state, my win is your win. Um, we're just saving people and we're getting through this. So for Jessica and nurses everywhere, no matter how many wins or losses, it's your dedication, compassion, and the hope you have for your patients. We are getting through this. On Staten Island, Jessica East Hope, Currents News. Praise for healthcare workers isn't stopping in New York City. The Holy Father also gave nurses a special shout out today during his mass at Casa Santa Marta. He called their work on the front line a vocation, not a profession. Que il Signore li benedica. In questo tempo della pandemia hanno notato esempio di eroicità. E alcuni hanno dato la vita. Pope Francis has praised nurses before. Earlier this year, he praised the World Health Organization for declaring 2020 the year of the nurse.
Some of the most beautiful places on Earth, the Vatican Museums, will soon be open again. Keeping visitors safe is a priority. There will be scanners to check temperatures, and everyone must wear a mask. Italy's Prime Minister already cleared the way for museums, libraries, and other exhibitions to open on May 18th. And while cases are decreasing in Italy, they're increasing again in U.S. prisons. One of our lead stories tonight, the prison system is still struggling during this pandemic. At least 304 prisoners have died because of coronavirus, and deaths are rising at a rapid rate. According to the Marshall Project, they increased 39% in just one week. Prisons are a breeding ground for the virus, spreading among a population forced into close quarters. John Patakis has more than 40 years of experience working in the criminal justice system. He's a former assistant chief probation officer at the Somerset County Probation Department in New Jersey and a criminal justice professor at Ryder University. He joins us now to talk more about this topic. And John, the number of cases is just stunning. What's your reaction to how rampant the virus has spread in prisons? Yeah, well, you know, it's a difficult situation in the prisons. Uh, it's very hard to social distance them because of the environment, okay? Right. Uh, and, you know, the other issue is that uh, they didn't have enough preparation for it uh, to get masks, uh, any other type of uh, sanitizers, et cetera. So uh, they're striving to, you know, uh, catch up. And depending on the state and the location, uh, the Northeast obviously uh, has a much more, you know, uh, difficult problem because of the number of people in prison. You right. know. Now, some prison but, systems have taken an unusual step. They're trying to stop the spread here in New York and in Los Angeles. Thousands of prisoners have been released. Do you think that's the answer? Well, yeah, if you do it very carefully. Now, what they're looking at usually is those with some type of medical problems, senior citizens over the age of 60 years old, uh, with, notwithstanding the fact that uh, it can't be any violent crime, any murder, any very aggressive type crime. Uh, and if they're on the shorter end of their, their sentence, then they'll be considered for release. Uh, they're usually placed home on home detention with electronic monitoring. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's it's one of the things that they're, they're really uh, trying to do now uh, on a very careful basis. You know. you know, it's a big issue for the Catholic Church. The Pope has long advocated for people imprisoned. Are secular governments doing enough to keep them safe? Should they have done something sooner? Well, uh, you know, nobody ever knew that it was going to come to this extent, you know. So should they have done something sooner? Well, yes, they should have if we know, you know. But now we have to play catch up. And there are some things that can be done to catch up with that. Now, you know, the National Guard and Army Reserve have been called out for, like, uh, some of the uh, aftercare facilities and nursing homes or whatever. So perhaps, you know, we can utilize more of the National Guard, Army Reserve. They have social workers. They have psychologists. Uh, they have doctors and nurses. And, you know, uh, so it would be a matter of activating them for additional help in the prison, you know. Uh, the other thing they can do is, and some prisons are doing this, utilize some of the staff to help uh, make uh, masks, uh, to help with making sanitizing, to go around and do some of the sanitizing. Right, you know? now there's something else happening in the prisons. LA County released video showing inmates who tried to get the virus so they can get released. Do you think prison system officials are educating inmates about how serious the pandemic is? It's not just a get out of jail free card. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, <clears throat> now that, that's certainly not uh, the right approach, or whatever. But uh, are they educating them enough? Well, you know, it depends on the prison system. You know, mm -hmm. each state operates their own prison or whatever. Some are more uh, <clears throat> uh, ahead of the ballpark by educating them. Uh, some are in the process of doing it. Uh, OK, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, uh, there still needs to be done. And again, a lot depends on the geographic location of where we're talking about. It's a much different system in South Dakota, uh, in Montana versus New York, New Jersey, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, uh, but but certainly that should be an ongoing process even right now because you got that population and, and they're very uneasy about that, you know. Right. People talk about a new normal once this pandemic is over. Do you think the criminal justice system will change at all? Well, it's making a lot of changes in the last 10 years or whatever. And now the emphasis is on more rehabilitation and uh, prison reentry programs uh, to have, uh, you know, them better prepared once they are released. So uh, I think you'll find uh, the numbers have been decreasing nationally in the last several years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we, we are implementing and reducing some of the sentences and uh, some of the mandatory sentences especially. So uh, I think we're on a good trend at this point, you know. 
All right, some good insight from a former. The, uh, I'm sorry. Once we get past the pandemic. Okay. Right, we have to get past that. A good insight. Thanks so much to former Assistant Chief Probation Officer John Patakis. Thanks for being here. Thank you. We're also seeing a spike in coronavirus cases in South Korea, and they're linked to Seoul's nightclub district. Bars and clubs there recently reopened and were packed. More than 100 infections have been reported as the nation tests thousands of people who visited the area. Still to come on Currents News, check your phone to see if you have the virus. It just might be that easy soon. Also ahead, she's wise beyond her years. Wait until you hear what this 14-year-old has just accomplished. If you have a story idea or want to share a tip, email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. Imagine using your smartphone to find out if you have the coronavirus. By the end of the summer, you just might be able to. Researchers in Utah are working on it. What started as a device to help detect a completely different virus could become a big part of tracking COVID-19. We started this project about 12 months ago, and the main idea was to enable people to have their own personal sensors to detect Zika in places that they travel. Masood Tabib Azer is the lead engineer working on this project. The plan is to take the Zika virus sensor and program it to identify COVID-19 instead. Our Prototype is going to be on the order of the size of a quarter, and it would be communicating with a cell phone using the Bluetooth link. If someone were to breathe, cough, sneeze, or blow on the sensor, it would be able to tell if someone had COVID-19. The results would then be displayed on a cell phone within 60 seconds. It could also test for the virus on a surface by using a swab and placing it onto the sensor. Tabib Azer says he wants to make it possible to send the results to health agencies too. You push the button, it can uh, send to a central location, Center for Disease Control, or any other authority that you select in your uh, options, and then in real time can update the map. The sensor will be reusable because it can destroy the previous sample with a small electrical current. In principle, you can put these devices in everybody's hand, and once we produce them in large scale, inexpensively, then it's like any other thing that people want to have with them. The plan is to have a working prototype in two months before submitting it for clinical trials. That's expected to last another month. So hopefully in three months time, this will be something any of us can use. And finally tonight, school hasn't been the same for students since the outbreak began, but that hasn't stopped one from achieving something extraordinary. Tiara Abraham is 14 years old and about to become a college freshman. She's been accepted to eight highly accredited California universities, even though she's not old enough to get a driver's license. Tiara also has a wonderful singing voice that she wants to use in her future. My ultimate goal is to, you know, sing for opera companies and at, you know, big venues like the Metropolitan Opera House. Um, you know, uh, I've already sung at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> Tiara comes from a family of overachievers. Her brother got his bachelor's degree when he was 14. She hopes to get a doctorate of musical arts. Wow. And that is Cards News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.